The Metropolitan Revolution means that smart local and metropolitan leaders aren't waiting for Washington, or in many cases from their state leadership. They're stepping up and doing the hard work to grow more jobs and to make their communities more prosperous. Let's talk for a minute about the power of metropolitan areas. The nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas are already the engines of our economy and the centers of trade and investment. They sit on about one-eighth of our land area, but they're home to two-thirds of our population, and they produce three-quarters of our gross domestic product. On the indicators that matter for the kind of economy that we need to create for sustained, far-reaching growth, metropolitan areas punch far above their weight. They account for 75, 80, 85, even 90 percent of the national share. So it's not surprising that when it comes to reorienting our economy in the wake of the recession, this is where we have to start. But even metropolitan areas have some bad habits to break and some adjustments to make as they shift, again, from consumption to production. In our book, we tell the story of seven metropolitan areas that are getting the basics right, as we say, and creating ecosystems in which people can flourish and the economy can grow. Denver and Los Angeles are investing in state-of-the-art transit, and as the mayor was kind enough to say, Denver has created a culture of collaboration between city and suburb that is durable and has gotten great results, particularly with the transit project that it's investing in. New York City is becoming a technology hub, and Northeast Ohio is reinventing manufacturing. Houston is helping immigrants become entrepreneurs. Portland is linking small businesses with new markets in global cities. And even Detroit has a place in the metropolitan revolution as it reinvents its midtown and downtown as an innovation district. I want to give an overview this evening of three examples of how metropolitan leaders are recognizing the economic and political necessity and opportunities that they face and rising to the challenge. I've chosen examples that I hope will resonate here in Providence based on your own economic, social, and demographic profile and some of the challenges that you're facing. The first story comes from New York. As you know, New York City was the epicenter of the global financial meltdown. City leaders before the crash had thought, you know, yeah, we probably do need to start rebalancing their econ our economy to be less dependent on the financial sector, but we'll do that later. The Great Recession made this rebalancing not just a good idea, but an urgent necessity. It's hard to remember now, right, because New York came back so strongly and we associate it with such great wealth, but city revenues shrank by $2 billion in New York City in 2009 and another $1.4 billion in 2010. Lower government and consumer spending contributed to an economic decline in New York that erased about 140,000 jobs from city payrolls. So city leaders started to ask themselves a simple question. What can we do in New York to increase economic activity? And I love that this story comes from the Bloomberg administration because Mayor Bloomberg and the people that he surrounded himself with are people who are pretty confident, right? They think they know a lot about what they're doing. But when it came to reorienting the New York economy, they didn't go into a room, lock the door, and have a brainstorming session by themselves. They reached out to 300 business leaders, several dozen community groups, dozens of college and university presidents, and they asked them, imagine you could do anything. There are no constraints. What would you do to increase economic activity in New York? The answer they heard over and over again was, New York needs more technology talent. So city leaders decided that the way to generate that talent was to create a graduate school that would not only create tech workers for new kinds of industries and fields, but would also be the hub of new sectors of the city's economy and technologies that existing sectors of the city's economy, fashion, finance, yes, media, and medicine could benefit from. In December 2010, the city and the New York City Economic Development Corporation launched an international competition to bring a new science and engineering graduate school to the city. Between December 2011 and April 2012, the city announced three applied sciences campuses. 
And after we got this presentation perfected and put all this information in the iPad app, the city threw us a curveball and announced a fourth uh, applied science campus that's associated with Carnegie Mellon University and Steiner Studios at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The city leveraged about $130 million, mostly for site improvements, to attract about $2 billion so far in private investment. All told, these schools are expected to generate about $33 billion in economic impact, more than 48,000 jobs, and nearly 1,000 new companies over the next 30 years. The Applied Sciences graduate schools will help New York strengthen existing clusters and seed new ones in urban transportation, energy efficient buildings, and city design. I think the New York Applied Sciences story is particularly relevant to Providence because from what I can tell, uh, the commercialization pipeline in this metropolitan area uh, has a kink in it. While you have a lot of innovation inputs like federal research grants and outstanding research institutions, your patent rate lags the US average. According to Brookings Research, while Providence is about the 31st largest metropolitan area, when, it when you look at patents per 1,000 jobs, you plummet to 81st. That suggests that there is not, uh, or there, that there is room for a lot more commercialization of the research and development that's going on here. Just as New York's economic development team did, Providence's leaders need to open up the innovation pipeline. I'm not necessarily suggesting that you copy the applied sciences model wholesale. Uh, generally, places that copy don't succeed. You have to adapt and tailor. But you could think more broadly and more boldly about new ways to connect research to marketable products. The Knowledge District, I think, could be a big part of that effort. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on in my remarks. New York City's economic transformation was led by a strong mayor with close ties to business leaders and uh, an outsized international profile. And that's why the Applied Sciences competition was successful as an international competition. In other places, though, the metropolitan revolution is led by leaders from other sectors, including philanthropy. I spoke earlier about the need to shift away from a consumption-oriented economy towards one oriented more towards production and exports. And that includes making manufacturing a part of the metropolitan economy. Many people believe that manufacturing is dead and gone. It's a thing of the past. It's an economic millstone. It is certainly true that manufacturing in highly developed economies has changed dramatically and is unlikely to be, on its own, a huge source of employment. But there's still an important role for this sector in a metropolitan economy. And that's because manufacturing and innovation, which we used to think were two entirely separate things, turn out to be closely intertwined. Researchers have found several examples of North American companies sending production facilities overseas in search of cheap labor, only to see research and development capability take root there as well. This happens because new ideas for products and processes are not only coming from scientists in office suites and laboratories, but also from the men and women who are working with their minds and hands on the shop floor. Understanding how things work and how they're put together is absolutely crucial to understanding how they can be altered and improved. The northeast corner of Ohio is home to several metropolitan areas, Cleveland, Akron, Canton, and Youngstown, that were hit very hard by deindustrialization, somewhat like Providence has been. During a period in which the United States as a whole lost 25% of its manufacturing jobs, these communities lost 44% of their manufacturing jobs. Those numbers sound a little bloodless. This is hundreds of thousands of jobs. To turn Northeast Ohio's economy around, a group of philanthropies created a new organization called the Fund for Our Economic Future. The goal of the fund was to support a new economic ecosystem in the region. Cleveland, Akron, Canton, and Youngstown had many of the raw ingredients for advanced industries, including great universities, major healthcare centers where ideas were developed, and the technological know-how to commercialize these ideas. What they often lacked was entrepreneurial talent and venture capital. The fund helped to create new networks that connected the existing strengths and further linked them 
to people who knew how to build and invest in companies. These companies drew on the biomedical, alternative energy, flexible electronics, and water technology clusters that had historic roots in the region. I was chuckling to myself a little bit. When you guys talk about water fire, you think of it as a lovely event. When Cleveland talks about water fire, right, it's a disaster. But that's how they got a water technology cluster, because when your river is on fire not in a good way, you get pretty smart about how to do environmental cleanup. So that's become a sector that the region is, is developing. Northeast Ohio is still not where it wants to be or where it needs to be in terms of job growth or other indicators of competitiveness, but there are signs that things are moving in the right direction. The fund estimates that, that the grants it has made have helped to add more than 10,000 jobs, more than 330 million in payroll, and $1.9 billion in investments to the region. More than half of these gains have come in the last three years, which suggests that the momentum is growing. That one big prize that the region, for example, has uh, recently won is the National Manufacturing Innovation Institute in 3D printing, which the federal government decided to build in Youngstown after seeing how many institutions in the region were linked in a network and eager to support this new institute. There's an interesting parallel, actually, that I found when I was researching the book between what philanthropies are doing and what's happening in the for-profit world. Companies are also learning that to innovate, they have to network with their suppliers and customers and also with their peers and competitors. Knowledge-intensive sectors, including chemicals, biotechnology, telecommunications, and semiconductors, have themselves recognized that they have to collaborate to compete. These collaborators tend to concentrate in metropolitan areas or groups of metropolitan areas, like the four Northeast Ohio metros or Boston and Providence, to good effect. Using networks to connect innovative institutions like universities and research centers to manufacturers and to entrepreneurs is again something that Providence should take note of and is starting to do with groups like Founders League. And again, I'll address that a little bit later when I talk about innovation districts. Manufacturing is 8% of the state of Rhode Island's GDP, down from about 28% in 1980. And the state is losing ground in terms of advanced industries, which are the cutting edge, high value added manufacturing that's driving innovation and still is quite strong in the United States because of our relatively well-educated workforce. The question I leave with you is, how can you follow Cleveland's model and turn those numbers around? My third story is about how metropolitan areas are, are connecting not just internally or in the same state or region, but across the globe. Portland, Oregon is known here as a path-breaking green region. It was the first U.S. city to enact a local plan to reduce CO2 emissions, and the metropolitan area runs a comprehensive system of light rail, suburban commuter rail, buses, and bike lanes. These investments in livability, however, didn't protect Portland from the impacts of the Great Recession. As local leaders were trying to revitalize their economy, they came to see that the lifestyle that they were so proud of and that had drawn them to or kept them in Portland in the first place was actually something that they could brand and sell to the rest of the world. And they have, posting some of the results that you see here. Uh, specifically, a doubling of their total exports value between 20, oh, excuse me, between 2003 and 2010. As cities and metros have filled with greater shares of the world's population, metro building has created immense market opportunities. As metros grow, they need infrastructure of all kinds, energy, transportation, telecommunications, housing, and schools. Portland leaders recognized that they could sell the tools, products, and policies, not just material goods, but a set of services, including government regulation to grow in a green manner. And that what worked to create sustainability in their region could be applied abroad. Portland launched a We Build Green Cities effort to promote the region's clean tech companies and products as solutions for global clean economy challenges. And local firms are now exporting homegrown green tech to booming cities in Qatar, China, and Brazil. Providence's share of uh, the economy that it exports is about 12%, which is right at the, it, it matches the U.S. share. What you trade internationally or with other metros in the United States is what makes your economy grow. So as you look to grow, you can take two lessons from Portland. First, 
How can this region see its service economy through new eyes, not as something that's just to support the local economy, but as a potential source of exports? For example, are there preservation tools, firms, policies, ideas that other places want and that, that Providence has really got a lock on, has really been able to understood, understand? Are there ways that you could reach outside this metropolitan area and sell preservation solutions to places that are just now waking up to the importance of maintaining their own heritage? And second, how can you reach out to new markets outside the United States? 95% of the world's customers live outside the United States. If you're banking just on the domestic market, you are limiting your chances for growth. Now, before I embark on my uh, next story about innovation districts, I, I want to pause for a minute and note what the undertakings in New York, in Northeast Ohio, and in Greater Portland have in common. Fundamentally, they're all designed to create a more innovative economy. So New York City needed the raw material, uh, the raw mines, if you will, to create innovation and technology, not just for its tech sector, but to connect technology to its existing medical, media, and fashion industries. Northeast Ohio needed to move innovation out of its research institutions and hospitals and into the hands of skilled entrepreneurs who could commercialize these ideas and send them out into the global market. Portland needed also to sell its innovative ideas. And in fact, in wealthy countries, exports are very closely intertwined with innovation because other places can always make cheaper things than the United States but they need, to buy, they need to buy the most innovative, cutting edge, and effective products from us. 